Hello, I. Good afternoon, everybody, for this uh, parallel session on the question of uh, culture. Culture after or for the moment in the COVID, but we will see with our three guests probably also the future. Because for the moment, it's, uh, it's an evident uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic, the cultural and the creative sector has been one of the most affected ones, as well as museums, uh, theater, cinema, concert halls and cultural spaces have experienced a total closure, a slow reopening and a general uncertain situation. And the consequence is a decline of users and increasing unemployment in the sector. However, the sector is also creative and plenty of artists and uh, museum creators have managed uh, to bring the culture to the homes of citizens through social networks or other tools that internet offers. On the basis that access and participation to culture is considered a fundamental right for every citizen, in this session we want to reflect on how the crisis has impacted an already precarious sector. And second, we analyze the potentialities that this crisis could offer to such a creative sector. So for this session, we invited three speakers from three different countries, three different parts of Europe, but also from three different cultural sectors. And I really want to, to thank them for accepting immediately our invitation. And I can say that each of them is a really high level ambassador of the culture. So how we will uh, do this, uh, this session, uh, after a short presentation of each of them, we will have a cultural moment before their intervention. And then we will have time with the public for a Q&A session before the conclusion. I give you some technical instructions. When uh, we open the floor for the questions, don't forget, but I think that everybody now is used of that, don't forget, use the raise hand button to ask for the floor. And it's our staff will give you the permission to broadcast. Make sure also that your camera and microphone are on and wait a few seconds until you become visible. And then wait until you are visible before you start talking. And then you introduce yourself. We will not take any questions, written questions in the chat. So make sure to raise your virtual hand when we start the Q&A session. So that's for the technical uh, in, uh, instructions. And now we begin with our, with our guests. And thank you, thank you very much, Agnieszka Holland, to accept this Hello. invitation. I make a, a short presentation for, for the public. So Agnieszka is a very world famous Polish director with three Academy Awards nominations and received many prestigious film awards. Some of her films include Europa, Europa, Olivier, Olivier, Secret Garden, many others, and also a latest movie from 2020, Sarlatan. I don't know if I pronounce well. She also directed episodes from well-known series like The Wire or The Killing, but I know that there are some others also. And first, before I give the floor, we would like to show you a piece of her work. This is a trailer for her 2017 film Spore, based on the novel Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead by the Polish winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, Olga Tokarczuk. And now we see the trailer for three minutes, and after it's to you, Mrs. 
Holland. Bóg dał miejsce zwierzętom niżej. Taki jest porządek świata. To co mam zrobić? So, Mr. Orland, we want to know how the pandemic has affected the cinema sector, but also your work as filmmaker in terms maybe of inspiration, capacity to develop or start projects. And also, what do you think are, are the challenges and the chances of the cinema and of uh, cultural sector of, after the crisis? And finally, also the need of more coordination among pan-European filmmaking organizations. Hmm. I, I hope that I understood what you say because I'm I'm hearing you really, really, um, really badly. It's juttering and jumping, and um, it shows how difficult it's to communicate, um, even verbally on um, on this um, COVID time, because I'm I'm spending half of my life in inside of the Zoom. Uh, and sometimes the connection is okay, and sometimes it's bad, and now, unfortunately, it's bad. Do you hear me well? Okay, no problem. We hear you very well. Okay. Go on. Um, so, um, you know, that is, um, regarding the cinema, the, the situation is very complicated, because um, some deep changes started before COVID. It means more and more of the distribution moved into the VOD and streaming platforms. And um, it seems that the young generation, uh, which is um, used to live in virtual world much more than uh, older generations, they somehow moved also there. So um, the attendance in the movie theaters have been pretty good in most of the countries before COVID and in some even very good. But the tendency, the trend was that the platforms economically are taking more and more space. And COVID, of course, first thing um, it hit, it hit the cinema theaters. Um, the theaters have been closed practically immediately with the, with the first lockdown in mid-March in most of the countries and even uh, if some it wasn't closed the people were afraid to go there um, i was actually quite lucky because my two last films uh, mr jones and charlatan opened in between two covid waves um, uh, mr jones in france charlatan in czech republic and did fantastic actually box office i don't know why because they are pretty gloomy films certainly not uh, like an um, um, easy entertainment maybe it co they corresponded somehow with the you know with the with the things the people have been thinking about but in generally um, it became very clear uh, to, uh, to our community that the, the film economy will be changing, the economy of the distribution and also the economy of the production. Um, and um, Europe is not very well equipped for that. Um, we, are, we are like really 
impotent in face of big American um, uh, platforms, Netflix, Amazon, uh, Hulu, um, Apple, Disney, etc., etc. They are they have um, enormous capital and the global uh, global audience, uh, and they started to produce also, which is good for the work of uh, European filmmakers. Um, many of my friends and my daughter also are working right now um, for Netflix, uh, directing, shooting the, the series and movies. But in the same time, it means uh, that um, uh, this um, American corporations became like the main, uh, main uh, distributor of the content. And the content is what they like, of course. The content is what comes from um, their cultural experience and what is also commercially global. It means the lock, um, they, are, they are doing even the series in local languages, in Polish, in Spanish, in, in French. Uh, but uh, of course, they are choosing the material which, um, uh, which um, will be attractive also for American, Asian market, etc. It means this um, uh, specificity of different cultures is somehow disappearing. Uh, and certainly the European voice or European cultural specificity is endangered uh, and mm, we are paying now the price for the fact that no one in Europe was really thinking about uh, about um, the future no one was thinking about the uh, innovation of the of the film economy uh, about innovation of film distribution why in Europe when we have so many talents and so many money in the European Netflix never was created uh, why um, in Europe? Why in the European Film Academy, where I was a chairwoman for a while, and now uh, will become probably the president of this academy? Uh, we have uh, academies unite, uniting the filmmakers from all European countries, and I think it's very useful and very like um, creatively um, um, good tool to 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 connect the community and to promote to some extent our work. But in the same time, when you uh, compare it with American Film Academy, which I am the member also, which is huge, mm, uh, very rich um, um, organization, uh, it, it's, it's practically, it's, it's like the little, you know, little puppy in front of the elephant. Um, we are not independent, really. We, ha we depend on the public funds only. And most of the European cinema depends on the public funds, which is, of course, nice because it's not this push of the commerciality which exists in, uh, in American cinema. But at the same time, it made the filmmakers more lazy and more somehow close in some kind of the bubbles of the comfort zones. Uh, and COVID, I think, shook the situation to the to such extent that maybe it will be a you know the awakening. Maybe we have to understand that the only thing we can win with this situation, with this change, and with the challenges of the of the of the of the modernity is to uh, forget the mediocrity. It means to be much more ambitious, much more to 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 raise the standards and to really connect to the audience to understand what what really is important in our world right now and uh, how we can communicate in the way which is attractive understandable and in the same time ambitious and new okay thank you thank you very much for this uh uh what you say even if it's quite uh not so optimist, really, uh, because you under, you underline the dependence uh, of the cinema here in Europe on uh, on public funds, and uh, also that uh, maybe nobody here in Europe was thinking, as you say, to the future. I hope that we are not too late for the moment. I hope to, so. No, I'm, I'm not against the public. I'm not against the public funds. No, but of I course, think it has to be. In, 
that ecosystem of the you know of the of the film economy ma ma must to be much richer you know we are a bit like in zoological garden if i will use you know the the ecological terms and um, we need you know we we have to risk we have to you know go out and um, and um, and communicate with our people and not only to look at them you know from behind the bars okay and uh I know that you have also responsibility on a European level and uh, and so uh, uh, I hope because we need more coordination about, uh, about uh, among uh, pan-European filmmaking organizations that uh, as you said the COVID pandemic uh, this pandemic shock maybe the situation I hope it shock we hope it shock enough that something it's uh, is changing but we we will speak uh, uh, in the maybe in the Q&A session also about this and let me let me now go to another part of Europe but also to another sector to see the 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 situation and now with uh, Moro Durante who is uh, from the south of uh, of Italy, hello, uh, hello, Moro, and you are violinist, uh, percussionist, uh, but also composer, leader of uh, well-known Italian folk music uh, band, Canzoniere Greccanino Salenti. No, I tried. I'm not sure it was right. Um, but you also played uh, in all major world music festivals and you won the Songlines Music Award as best group in uh, 2018. Uh, you who has kindly to taken some time off also from the recording because I know that you are very busy on your latest uh, album for, for the moment. Uh, and what we would like to show is exactly related to the pandemic because during the COVID crisis, you led the project, we are all in the same dance and that's really very, very true today. And uh, you did it in support of Amnesty International Italy. It's a music video made of several clips of dancers from everywhere to show that we are all in this together, fighting and dancing in solidarity. And so I propose to listen to this dance all together before I ask you some questions. I think that we have to find a solution because we see only a short part of your video. If we find a solution, we, we will show it after uh, your speech. But uh, if I, I can ask you a little bit the same question than uh, Mrs. Holland, uh, how the pandemic has uh, affected the music uh, sector and the huge difficulties also that live music bands are going through but also, if you can maybe give some uh, solutions or some ideas to put, in pl to put in place to support this sector at a European uh, uh, level, considering also the vital importance that the culture has for the moment in our existence. Moro, it's you. Hello, everybody. And thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be among you. And you know, the COVID-19 pandemics um, hit the music system really hard. It was a very harsh blow because, uh, as you can imagine, so many concerts were, in the best case, delayed or even cancelled. And many venues are closing or are closed 
some of those are temporarily closed, some others are basically considered, you know, never reopening because of the cost of maintenance during this COVID crisis. And many festivals are, you know, stopped or uh, are cancelled. And as a, you know, the music as a whole system it doesn't involve only musicians or artists. It's also about audio technicians, crew members, uh, tour managers. So this entire music system is a, is at risk. Um, many, many music workers could be forced not to work in this field anymore at the end of this pandemic because they will be in looking for a way to keep on living and earning some money. So I think that we might need to actually find ways to sustain this music, I mean, music as a system and not only by funding, uh, you know, workers uh, to survive these periods, because otherwise, when all of this will be over, most of our uh, realities will be gone by then. And nothing, we will we'll have to deal with the hashes of, uh, of what was there. Also, if you're not an artist who is, uh, you know, uh, like I say, like a mainstream or commercial artist where you can maybe count on the on ticket sales only, then it gets hard because even th those festivals or, uh, you know, um, a series of concerts were uh, f uh, funded publicly. And now all those uh, funds, of course, are going to be cut because the uh, first thing you cut in crisis periods is hearts. So um, that's putting all of us at risk. I think that creating a sort of European network that can help the system as a whole by coordinating, you know, some sort of pan-European uh, network of festivals, pan-European network of venues, uh, venues or organizations uh, which deal with music, uh, and even finding a way to produce and promote a sort of a virtual platform which can host on a European level, uh, you know, live streaming shows and that way even being able to uh, pay workers such as audio or video technicians and crew members uh, to produce those and then find a way to make them available to the audience uh, either, you know, for uh, free or paying some very cheap tickets to watch them on streaming uh, could be another possible solution. But I think that the key should be basically getting ready to, to move on when all of this is, is, uh, is over, otherwise uh, it would mean collapse for, uh, for most of us. Th thank you very much, uh, Moro. We know it's very difficult for, for the moment, and as you say, maybe, and that's really a problem, uh, uh, the first things that we cut for the moment in uh, some uh, subvention or is our budget is, uh, is art. But uh, maybe that, as we said before, a shock is, uh, is, is coming also. And we have also seen during this uh, pandemic that uh, the people need to have art. Uh, absolutely, because it's supporting also the people who are alone at home, and so, and so it, it becomes what we what we we call also a common, a common for uh, for everybody and for the for the for the society. So, do you see also some some solution, something that you say it's absolutely necessary that we need that, and also uh, it's uh, it's something that you you say to the politicians. Now, today, we need that, not only maybe financial support, but other support. What will be your, your recommendation? Uh, as I suggested, I think that maybe the idea of creating a pan-European uh, virtual platform uh, which can host, you know, uh, the live streaming of shows and events and uh, so therefore involving uh, different countries uh, uh, you know, workers such as musicians, bands, but also, you know, audio technicians, crew members, uh, to realize these uh, high quality uh, live streaming shows where even, you know, the quality of the audio is taken care of. I think that that would be a way also to experiment new ways of, uh, uh, of um, living a live show experience in music because uh, nowadays most of the shows you can try to see live, live streaming, uh, are not with a very good audio quality. So I think that uh, basically pushing into that direction 
to be also a way to be on the same level of the like movie, movie platforms like Netflix or others, you know, and to have some sort of alternative for um, music workers to rely on. Okay, okay, thank you. So I hope you can you can stay, maybe not to four o'clock, but uh, some because uh, I've no doubt that maybe there are some reactions or some uh, uh, questions uh, for uh, from our participants. And uh, thank you, Moro. And now I go to our third uh, speaker, who is coming from uh, from Belgium, from uh, my city here in uh, in uh, in Brussels. And his name is Guy, Guy Gepens, and uh, it's an, another uh, sector. Uh, Guy is uh, currently head of performing arts at Canal here in Brussels. Canal is also working as a, with a Centre Pompidou from Paris. But it's, nah, I don't want to say a Centre Pompidou of Brussels, it's more than that. And uh, among other things, uh, he was also administrator of Beurskoburg, who is also a big cultural centre here in uh, Brussels. Uh, also director for the Spring Dance Festival in Utrecht and was the general and artistic director of the Kai Theater and Centre here in uh, Brussels also. And we would like to show you a video. I hope that we, we have the old video if if not that's that's a problem for the moment but of the performance choir piece by felix kinderman So, Guy, uh, it's a little bit the same question, but for your sector, the sector of big cultural uh, center, also how the pandemic has affected this uh, sector, who is most uh, the, the, the cultural institutions, and uh, maybe also what's, what's the role of, the, of this kind of institution in the life of, of a city, city uh, like, uh, like Brussels, and uh, also maybe uh, how this crisis, crisis gave maybe a new way for the cultural world uh, permits maybe to develop a new consensus linked to the notion of uh, of growth degrowth i know that you had many uh, events all around this uh, this uh, this question and also linked with the question of ecological transition well, thank you, Evelyn. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak at this council. Um, well, your question requires an extensive answer. Um, the pandemic affected arts and culture in so many ways. Um, there is so much to say, so it won't fit in the eight minutes I have. So I, I would like to focus on one element, one, one specific question. Why in this crisis that is questioning in such a fundamental and explicit way our relationship to the world that surrounds us, why in these circumstances do we still not recognize the crucial role that arts and culture play in shaping that relationship in, a, in an affected way? So let me begin with the, the short video you saw of Felix's work. Um, performing arts or life arts, they only exist when we come together. It's an essentially physical social act. And over the past few months, there has been a feverish search of digital alternatives, but these have turned out not to be very satisfactory. So coming together remains essential for artists to make their performances or music together. 
and physically coming together with an audience to share the art turns out to be just as essential and in a way a choir is an intensified version of that coming together it symbolizes the, the physical collectivity it symbolizes our urge to sing together to tell a story together it symbolizes the necessary closeness to enable an effective negotiation of voices it shows that collectivity is not only a rational negotiation of words but also a matter of finding the right tone feeling each other creating an effective connection with each other and choirs were actually the most affected by the corona choir the, the corona measurements in their artistic existence because keeping a distance and wearing the mouthpieces was compulsory for singers um, even during their performances because singing is projecting air it's intensified talking you could say so it's therefore dangerous or considered dangerous the choir piece was made as a work of art with the aim of questioning our mutual sociability it was a piece for a fragmented choir a choir that was dismantled in a museum space away from the classical biotope of the concert hall the church and the theater and the performance was a, a sort of constant movement of singers sliding in and out of each other and as a museum visitor you could experience for yourself what distance and proximity between singers did with a collective work but that was in 2019 long before corona crossed our path and when i asked felix to perform it in canal um, there was no corona either performing choir piece uh, with respects of the corona restrictions was actually a very odd experience as a bit as you can see on the on the video the effective charge of the work changed fundamentally the difference between distance closeness proximity was blurred and because of the mouthpieces proximity itself became distant hearing and seeing people singing without seeing the expression of the mouth and face it provoked actually a deep unrest uh, with the audience so we suddenly recognized that we had been what we had been feeling ourselves for months in watching this piece was a broken relationship between distance and proximity and that that broken relationship actually changes everything so our effective relationship to distance and to proximity was deeply disturbed by this COVID crisis and the reasons why we sometimes feel the need for distance and then at other times look for closeness uh, those reasons has be had become unclear but in spite of the difficult circumstances of the show and the high degree of unrest that the choir piece evoked as a work of art it did still stand but in a different way it made us think why we ourselves despite the deep disturbance of our lives why we were able to remain somewhat upright so choir piece suddenly became a symbol of vulnerability and resilience of ugliness and of beauty of a sense of loss and of a new valuable insight so it showed once again the essential importance of life art or art in general in dealing with uncertainty with our fears with the chaos of a deep crisis and it showed the effect of life art on our affective dealings with the world around us so it showed that art in general is our shared toolbox in a way for contemplating and understanding and developing a number of essential necessities of life the real problem for the arts is that for many defining actors in our society, including a lot of politicians, that is still not clear. In their reactions to the corona crisis, they demonstrated once again, I would say, that art and cultural in political terms is mostly a matter of economic importance. And because that economic importance, although not non-existing, is not so enormous, art and culture were soon included among the not too essential activities. So. The Corona crisis over the, the past 10 months has mainly exposed a major underlying systemic crisis. Nobel Prize winner Paul Romer, econom economist, he stated that we were facing actually a trauma. We had to choose between killing the economy or killing more people, health or wealth. There were two striking things about that statement. The first one was that it took until the Corona crisis for someone to do it. Our profound sociological crisis, which has been going on for decades, climate change is the most explicit symptom should of course have inspired Romer to make this statement about traumatic choices between health and wealth a long time ago and secondly the statement also exposes a systemic crisis in our interpretation of the word wealth our effective relationship to wealth or the good life is still an economic one apparently so as a collective exercise in change 
The Corona crisis has not been very interesting so far. It's mainly the nation state that has made a, a remarkable comeback as a strong state by implementing a, strictive, a restrictive framework with social control, emphasis on the economy. Uh, on an individual level, however, the Corona crisis has, in my opinion, proved to be a much more interesting experiment. It has made us all reflect on what we personally consider to be really important in life. Our individual understanding of the good life has been shaken up during the various lockdown periods. And for the first time, maybe in a very long time, our mental map has been slightly redrawn. For centuries, that mental map has been determined by what we could say the grand modernist capitalist project born in the Enlightenment erected by the French Revolution and then declared the only possible paradise by the American dream. And so the optimism associated with this American dream finds its origin not only in actual material progress, but also in unconscious fantasies that are implicated in this dream and that guide our emotions. So the effect of that unconscious framework shapes our emotions and has been incredibly effective. So in this it has led our imagination in a way to run wild, even though we knew that there were a lot of risks involved and ecological risks, but also human risks, and that inevitably there would be a lot of victims. And so in living with these victims, the ingenuity of the modern capitalist effect, I think, truly lies. Uh, um, so how could we live with the mix of good and evil, extreme luxury and precarity, winners and losers, profit and waste. So what would happen to that human and material waste of all this production today and in the future has increasingly little effect on us. So truth in a way has become abstract. And um, so it's difficult to identify many parts on the modernism material map because it's so abstract. And that is precisely, I think, why this one uh, path uh, to that American dream uh, it's, it's just left on our mental map. There was a philosopher, Lauren Berlin, called it cruel optimism. So clutching to a dream while you know full well that its fulfillment is, is being obstructed by structural and social circumstances. And so Berlin actually researched art forms uh, in different disciplines, a lot of film actually, to analyze <coughs> how this depletion of reality is experienced. So how people attempt to adapt to the situation sensorially, effectively. So which new modes of experiencing the present are being explored. So and this research resulted in what she called lateral agency. So small acts of self-interruption, self-abolition, self-deferment through which one can tamper when, with one's own value structure without immediately focusing on all will be well. And so we could say in a way that <clears throat> the lockdown has been such a momentum of lateral agency. It's been a self-break that has allowed us to pry loose our value structures. So what we need to do now is to prevent this shaken mental map from becoming entrenched again, prematurely. A real systemic approach will only stand a chance if we allow, recognize, and draw other paths to the good life on our mental map. And the arts they have an important role to play there on the field of the affective. They are a crucial player. And so Corona is just a symptom of a much broader socio-ecological crisis that requires this systemic approach. And if we want it to be effective, we need to invest a lot more and a lot more in art and culture <coughs> in order to achieve the affective and mental conditions for the change that we all want. Everybody here, I presume also on your uh, your Congress of the Green European Party is talking about the new Green Deal. If it is not also, and perhaps even mainly, inspired by a new cultural deal, it will not stand a chance. And so let us not forget that Roosevelt's New Deal, so long ago, contained a very, very important cultural component. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Uh, yeah. That's a, a very large debate. I'm sure that we have to come back on this, uh, on this, on this debate on another way, maybe than virtually like that. <clears throat> uh, and uh, and and maybe maybe no. I can ask maybe 
uh, Agnieszka Holland, do you have something to, to say to, to Guy or in reflection on what he, he expressed for the moment? So on this, uh, and I like this, this sentence, uh, effect of life art on affect. Uh, I think that's very significant on what he, he, he said and also of the, 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 the role of the, the culture uh, that can play on this uh, effect. If you want to say something about it now, maybe also from your sector, cinema, maybe you can make an intervention now. I don't hear you. Maybe you are on mute. Yes. Yes. Um, sorry, I had I had some some phone here ringing. I I don't hear I don't I didn't hear him well. You know, oh, my okay. problem is that the sound which is coming to me it's very jutted. It's like I understand every second word. But okay. If, if you ask me um, um, what it means, what this ex what the situation means for the culture, how culture can help the situation, uh, um, I think you know that somehow I feel, but that is the in intuition. It's not uh, any like based on any kind of the data um, um, knowledge that um, this global experience, and which is the uh, probably also the first global experience for the few generations since the Second World War, um, that it opens like another thinking about um, who we are, about what, what is important in your life, um, what imagination can change. And I believe very much in imagination also um, regarding the um, uh, climate uh, catastrophe and and um, and ecological changes. I think that the artists and the creators, the people, creative people, and creative institutions um, um, can be the best placed to open uh, up the new perspective um, uh, for the humanity altogether. Maybe it, it sounds very pompous, but uh, I think that what 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 pandemic taught us is uh, that we we don't control the future we don't control even the present we are out of control and we don't know what will be the, what will gonna happen uh, we lost this kind of the arrogance that we can control everything and um, control it on our um, on, on on our um, behalf on our uh, profit S uh, and you know when you are looking even on very popular uh, cinema or popular TV series, uh, some kind of the dystopic vision of the future and the catastrophes described in the commercial commercial films, popular commercial films uh, are, was, were actually premonitory. They actually shown a lot of things years ago, which now becomes our reality. So um, I think that when I was talking about my first inter intervention, that um, that we became lazy somehow, that um, we are living in some kind of the comfort zone, I was thinking that we are not using um, enough creatively our imagination to um, to feel the trends, to figure out what 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 is the real challenge of the of the um, of the situation and the real challenge for the future. Um, but I, I, I feel speaking to different people, my colleagues and also people from, from different um, uh, creative um, areas, that, that they start a part of being, you know, like in some kind of the depressive crisis for financial reason or whatever, they feel that they have really important role to play now, that, um, that they are opening up to some kind of the um, common thinking to some kind of the uh, of the of of, of the imagination of of imagine of the imagine. That, thank you, thank you very much. So, 
I, I have to 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 tell that uh, that uh, Moro has to leave for work issues, unfortunately. So he's not with us again. He he has to uh, to make this uh, new uh, new disc now. <laughs> album yes um, so what i what i hear from you also is that and i give again the the the, the floor to to uh, to Guy, uh is also that we are really in a, in a momentum i never say an opportunity because uh, to say that the pandemic is an opportunity is not very very well. No, it's maybe that uh, a, a momentum that can change uh, also something, uh, something in uh, in how we see the, the the world, also on the importance of the of the culture. Hoping that uh, politics and uh, be sure that we Greens we will try to push that and to support that that uh, the the politician world uh, understand how important is the is the culture and I think that uh, Guy explained also how the, the the importance of the of the culture also on the 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 mental health of the of the of the public so i think that's uh, that's important that there is a necessity to recognize the importance uh, of the of the culture and this pandemic made me the, the right shock so uh Guy, i i give you the floor and then we will go to the q a session uh after that but i i see that you wanted to react hmm. to what anieshka was saying yeah, I wanted to add something because I think it's um, uh, what Anastasia said is, is of course very crucial. And um, uh, using our imagination is of course our real force. But actually, I think something what what we started to realize is also that in in this COVID uh, pandemic is that um, using our imagination, we have to also consider it as a sort of privilege towards the species that. Uh, surround us. It's something that we can use also in a very, very wrong way. I mean, there's not so it's not so difficult to give examples. Um, I mean, our imagination so far has led a lot to a sort of independent thinking. Imagination in the in in favor of independence as 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 human beings. What became clear in COVID is, of course, that interdependence is in a way becoming so crucial. And uh, again, we should have known that a while ago. Uh, we, <laughs> it's a bit strange that it took a virus to make it clear to us. So how to use our in imagination in this reality of interdependence where included species um, that have not the same capacities of uh, imagination. So in a way, um, you could compare it in, in questions of intercultural or intersocial classes um how to be aware of of a, of a sort of privilege and at the same time use it uh, use the imagination realizing this privileged situation and taking the importance of the relationship with the other species as as a crucial one and the the, the short extract of the film uh, of Agnieszka, which is in the way a sort of interspecies uh, film as far as i can say of these 20 seconds but um is a good example of that Yes, uh, I shall give me now. I go to the Q and A session, but maybe I, I'm looking to my uh, assistant Angela if we can put again because we didn't hear the the song of uh, uh, of Moro. We try if it doesn't work, we come to the Q and A. But uh, maybe it's also a message uh, for uh, for for the future. We let's try.
wonderful. I think uh, it's uh, it's also an optimism uh, and uh, something looking to the to the future. It's why I wanted to see it uh, completely. So now I I. I speak to the participant uh, to this session. So as I said in the beginning for the technical instruction, uh, don't forget to use the raise hand button uh, to ask the floor. And so then we, we shall give you the permission to broadcast. So don't hesitate, now it's open for you. I've seen that uh, Stefanie Lepchinski was asking the, the, the floor. So, Stephanie, are you with us? Do you have a question? Do you have something to say? I hope it will work. It's coming. Yes, Stephanie, Hi. you're there. Um, yeah, thank you very much for giving me the floor, Stephanie Lepchinski with Ecolo. Hi, Evelyn. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the inspiring talks. Um, I had uh, a specific question because I thought that during the uh, during the lockdown and afterwards, artists were very, very creative in trying to uh, give us hope and make us uh, reflect on what was going on. And also they were very creative in, in trying to reinvent themselves. Um, they've been asked uh, to give us comfort, like uh, some artists, they've been given concerts to elderly uh, care uh, homes uh, um, some others they are uh, they completely reshaped the the way they wanted to uh, organize their festivals to make it happen with uh, with uh, participants uh, being in, in their bubbles but still enjoying concerts um, uh, getting headsets for example on the so that they can they, they could uh, uh, keep the, the social distances and so on uh, so we, we really saw the importance of of the creative people, but while there, then when it comes to uh, trying to actually support them in this in, in this endeavor, um, I'm really sad to actually hear them saying and and telling about their their art in in GDP. Uh, um, in, in economic terms, they're always trying to justify them through the economic prism, like how much they contribute to the GDP. And I, I feel very, very saddened about that uh, because artists and culture should not be about the economic, uh, the homo economicus in us. It should be about, I don't know, the philosophical part of us or the, uh, the just the emotional part of us or the human being uh, in us. So I just wanted to know what you think about that um, about that aspect. Thank you, Stephanie. I think it's uh, just what uh, Guy uh, was telling in the beginning of his uh, speech about this question of the economic importance of uh, uh, of culture that's always coming on the uh, on the floor. Guy, do you want to 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 ask to the question of Stephanie? No. Unmute. Okay, now it works. Yeah. It was the moderator who muted me. So. <laughs> um, uh, no, no, of course I, I agree uh, to that. I think it's what is important is also what you, I think what you say is also that the cultural world itself defends itself often in economic terms. And I completely agree. I think it's often a mistake that we try uh, to to play the game, to say, look, we, we are important for the GDP, we are important for uh, economic life, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think we have to be really careful with that. Uh, of course, it's, as I said, it's partially true. We, we have an, as a cultural world, we have an economic importance, and for different sectors, it's, 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 of course, very different. For the film sector, for instance, the economic importance is much bigger, and it's clearer, and the, the distribution of films uh, fits in, a, in, a, in an economic model that is easier to adapt uh, than, for instance, for life art, where the production efficiency of life art is, uh, is very, very, very small. So, <laughs> um, so in a way, it's not for everybody the same. But yes, I mean, I've met 
really difficult discussions with colleagues that uh, really tried to prove their economic importance. And then they said, yeah, but you will never win the game because there will always be somebody else in the entertainment business, business who is economically much more important than you. So, so it's not just that. So yes, I agree. And we should, we, we should learn how, how to use these arguments. And in a way, I think this crisis gives us the opportunity to do so because there is definitely more understanding for the other elements and the, the I mean, I'm, I'm critical and uh, I have doubts about uh, a lot of politicians understanding really the issue, but you can see that there is more understanding and that uh, uh, this individual experience uh, also as a politician or as a, as a uh, the, 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 let's say, decision maker in general, you're also a person that uh, experienced a crisis and has now suddenly had different experiences. So you feel the difference. And so there, I think there is a window of opportunity there. Yeah. But we should then use, come up with the right arguments and not make our own mistakes of using the economic arguments only. Thank you, Guy. I don't know if Anieszka has something to say, if you heard about what Stephanie was saying. Give, no? I don't hear you. You're on mute. Maybe it's the animator. Yes? Yeah, I, I didn't hear well her question. I heard uh, Guy's answer but much better. So I can <laughs> answer it. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, but it, it really is very difficult to follow because I hear every second word. But um, yeah, what Guy said that the economy means something different in different uh, in different um, aspects of the you know of the um, in different domain of the of the of the art and creation and culture, uh, but in general we need money. You know, we need money to reach uh, the people and even to reach them through uh, through um, um, the platforms or internet or um, um, online. We need the money to do it properly and to not only send the information about what we are doing, but to send the, uh, to express it, to, 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 to guarantee the real experience. Uh, we, we can think that maybe the time came to, to, to be poorer. To, uh, that is my approach. I think that in some point, um, uh, the superficiality became more important than the essence. Uh, in the content we are we are we are giving to the world but um, but in the same time um, i you know i'm i i i believe that i believe that the creative people will survive um, but in the same time uh, i i think that a lot of fabric of institutions and connections which was established especially in europe is endangered now. And I also feel that, for example, European Union never paid real attention to the need to the need of the of the culture. They they've been mostly focused on economical issues and um, uh, political issues and eventually social issues to some extent. Uh, but the education, culture, uh, science was in the background. And I think what really can save us is exactly culture and uh, science and education. And it needs money. It needs money. For example, to create the platform for, um, uh, for European um, artists and filmmakers, which can be global platform and attractive platform, you need to spend money. You know, it's nothing. It's for free. Thank you. Thank you, Anieszka. And uh, yes, it, it's true. The question of the involvement or no involvement from the European Union in the question of culture is also maybe because it's not considered, uh, culture is not considered come as a European portfolio, as as other other question. That's uh, that's real. It's why also we Greens we will begin now in uh, in January to have a, a real working group with uh, with webinars on this question of uh, of culture, and we want to to bring it uh, really and a, a real uh, priority. Uh, I mean, and so far, I think for, for Europe. 
um, culture was, of course, linked to the identities of the nation states and the member states. And they never wanted really to get involved. And if they get involved, is the economic aspects of it. So the fact, should, the fact is, if they call, uh, if if Europe wants to develop uh, a cultural policy, there was always the excuse, yeah. Uh, we cannot in, intervene because it's a local issue, it's a nation state issue. Uh, this crisis makes global interdependence and European interdependence more clear than ever before. So there is a really strong point to make nowadays to leave that argument behind and to say, okay, enough with this excuse not to get involved in culture because of national identities and it being a local uh, issue and really make a point for a, at least a European, not uh, why not a global uh, uh, policy uh, domain. So I think it's, uh, I have heard that argument about national identity uh, so often that, uh, and I think that's something that really should be discussed. And this, the, 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 the New Deal, the, the Green New Deal is maybe also an opportunity to to, to put that on the table and to say no green European new green deal without the cultural component. Yes, you are completely right, and that's what we have to 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 uh, uh, to make. And with the in parallel with uh, with the group at the European Parliament, the Green Group is really to include this question of uh, uh, of culture in this green uh, green deal that is discussed for the for the moment with also a lot of money and so also to keep in mind that we have to include that in this uh, in this big discussion uh, well, yeah can i yes add okay. something? yes Na national identity is used mostly by the nationalists in different countries as a, 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 the instrument of the ex exclusion and i think that it can be used as the instrument of the inclusion that you know europe is rich because exactly the the, the um, um, summa of um, all those different identities and experiences but in the same time we have we have the same ground somehow you know we are are, 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 are the same but um, what i can observe that more european union politically economically became powerful uh, the European culture was circling less and less. Uh, at least uh, it, 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 in, it is like that with the cinema. When in 60s, 70s, even 80s, the circulation of the European films inside of Europe was very rich. You know, in, in, in Poland, you can watch um, in, um, French, Italian, Swedish film. Uh, uh, Russian in France or Germany, you can watch the films from over the Europe. It's not the case anymore. Like if we became one, practically one um, geographic territory, you know, with no borders, like the curiosity was evaporated, and the people started to flow more in their in their. Um, national cultures, in domestic cultures, let's say, even not national, and have less of the curiosity for, for others in general. So uh, only winner was, um, the global winner was the generic American productions, which been even not American, they've been generic because they didn't respond uh, to the uh, cultural identity of, of, um, of, of United States or Canada. And uh, now we are a little, you know, a little, we, we feel the complexes that, you know, we are, we have something to say, but no one is interested here in Europe. I'm speaking about, about the cinema, about the theater, about, you know, narrative and narrative arts. Yes, and so what I hear from you three, and I'm sure that uh, if I speak with other uh, cultural sector, it's the same. It's a real necessity for some uh, European platform. Uh, uh, and it's, it, yes, it's a fact that it doesn't exist uh, really for the, for the moment. And also that the, 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 the question of this European identity, we, 
but we have to see it as an inclusion, not on an exclusion, uh, of course. I don't know if there is another uh, participant who want to, to to speak. I don't see it was only uh, no. I, it was Stephanie, but only no. So okay. So we will go to the end of this uh, of this session, but it's really not finished. As I said to you, in uh, January we will we when and when I say we, it's the European Green Party, and now you understand that European Green Party is the federation of all or or Green Party in uh, in Europe. And when I say Europe, it's not only the 27 country, it's more larger than that. We will have a real discussion because we hope that for, for the Council in uh, autumn, uh, maybe we can have a, a, a sort of uh, an agreement, a text or something. But in parallel, we continue also to work with our member of the European Parliament, Green member of the European Parliament, to include of course this question of the the of the of the culture in the debate and in the actual debate of the uh, the green uh, the green deal and it's not very far as Guy said also of the question of the of the climate question of course and then i want to i would like to to close also this session be uh, uh, and i speak to more to the participant than to the or to uh, uh, speakers i want to say a few words about an initiative that we launched to to support uh, artists, creators, and performers. Uh, as we heard uh, today, during the pandemic, the cultural workers have been heavily affected. And uh, they, this cultural sector showed the solidarity with the citizens and they support really us mental, emotional well-being also through their, their work. And uh, you have seen that we we uh, we initiated a program the green family fund through which uh, you can show your solidarity and support also artists with a kind of uh, donation uh, we know that it's not only finance that are uh, that the, the, the cultural sectors want, but it's also a manner that we can show our interest also. This time we will keep the focus on the country of our council's co-host, Poland, and so some donation collected through the Green Family Fund will go to Polish artists and creators, and we will show that on our New Year's reception virtually, unfortunately uh, early next year oh yes now new year reception must be also virtually where you can you will see these uh, these artists of course you can find the link to the donation page under the description of this parallel session on spot me so i i have to close this session and uh, thank you very much tomorrow to Guy and to Agnieszka, it was really a pleasure. It was really very interesting. I think it opened some doors also to a global uh, debate, uh, not only culture in a corner, social or economic, because also our green, uh, green project uh, is a global project. And we really want to include culture in this project. So thank you to you and hope to see you uh, one day to, know, to a next uh, council, I hope so. And thank you to our participants to be with us this afternoon. And don't forget the day and the council is not finished. We have two very important uh, plenary on the question also of rule of law, of nationalism, on all this, uh, mm -hmm. this question, but also another plenary on the circular uh, economy and tra just transition. Thank you very much to everybody and take care, as we say, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you.